Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm James Shore. Every week we look at an interesting software engineering topic, a challenge or a technique or skill, come up with a challenge related to that topic, and then solve it live on stream. And this week, it's microservices without mocks. This is part one. This is going to be a big, uh, big topic, a big exercise. So we're going to be doing this over the next several weeks. And today in part one, we're going to be building a server from scratch. If you'd like to follow along, you can check out the code from GitHub, github.com slash James Shore slash Livestream. Check out this tag, 2020-06-02. At the end of the uh, at the end of the episode, you can check out the finished code uh, by checking out the tag 2020-06-02. Dash end. Uh, Jitter Ted, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks to uh, bringing for bringing your channel along. Uh, welcome to all of you. Again, what we're going to be doing today is we're building a microservice without mocks. And if you've been watching the series, you can you've seen in the previous episodes we've talked about testing without mocks. And if you haven't seen those episodes, you can find them down here, uh, jamesshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn uh, that has all the previous episodes. But very briefly, the the thing with mocks, mocks are a great way of testing that your code works in isolation. They can test that a unit works and that even that it calls its dependencies, but it can't test that it calls its dependencies correctly. So your mock-based tests, your solitary tests, have gaps. So as we talked about last week, you can use sociable, overlapping sociable tests to fill in those gaps. But what we've been doing up until now has basically been toy examples. So the question is, uh, how do you solve this problem? How do you work without mocks when you're working with real code? Uh, and so what we're going to do is today, we're going to take our Rote 13 application that we built in previous episodes. That was just a little command line application which converted uh, text on the command line using Rote 13. That's the little spoiler uh, hiding stuff you see on the internet. The, 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 the business owners of this fictional business have decided to enter the highly lucrative, or at least they think it's highly lucrative, RAS market. That's Rote 13 as a service. So we're going to take our command line application, we're going to turn it into a microservice, which can do the Rote 13 transformation for the hordes of people who are willing to pay money for us to do this. Um, spoiler, not a lot of money in this, but you know, whatever. <laughs> now the question is, we've, we've talked about in previous episodes how to build code without using mocks. But the question is, when you're dealing with this type of larger problem, uh, how do you deal with all the complexities involved with working with a real framework? Now for today's episode, the command line infrastructure is all done, the Rote 13 logic is all done, so we're just going to be building the server and the HTTP server uh, infrastructure. And there are several questions. First, just how do we begin? Where do we begin and how do we begin? How do we test this code without launching the server? And how do we test that our code responds to requests? Uh, because of course, if we're not running a real server, the way a real server works is you get a request in from a browser and the code's gonna respond to that. How do we test that our code responds to those requests when we don't have a real server and we don't have any real requests? So I'm going to let you give that a ponder. While you're thinking about that, this stream is made possible by the people who hire me for coaching and consulting. Uh, I generally folks who have organizations with the potential for a lot of bus business agility bring me in because they have that potential for business agility, but they don't have the technical capacity that they want. So they bring me in to do anything from test-driven development uh, training to other sorts of agile engineering practices training, up, all the way up to coaching and consulting around how to organize their teams, how to uh, define their processes, and especially how to do that when they have multiple teams working together. Because when you have multiple teams working together, the problems and solutions are different than when you just have one or two teams working together. And it's thanks to these fine folks that I'm able to do this for you today for free, because if it wasn't for them, I'd have to get a real job. And well, <laughs> we don't want that. So if you'd like to join these above average people, go ahead and send me an email at jshore at jameshore.com, or you can tweet me online at jameshore. And I'd be happy to set up a free consultation to talk about uh, what we can do together. All right, let's get back to the challenge. <clears throat> 
Uh, we want to build a road 13 as a service. And the question is, where do we begin? How do we test without launching the server? And how do we test that our code responds to requests? Well, three answers to that. First, we're going to begin by programming by intention. We're going to use nullable infrastructure wrappers to test without launching the real server. And we're going to test their code response to requests by using behavior simulation. Let's look at each one of these in turn. Uh, programming by intention. This, so this answers the question, where do we begin? Programming by intention is writing the code that you wish you could write. So you write your code as if all the code that you need is already written. And that will help you define what interfaces that do we need to write. And then we can comment it out. Um, we implement the missing functions, and then we come back, we write the tests, and we uncomment it, and we fix it up. So that's where we begin. Now, second, uh, how do we test without launching the server? Well, we've answered this in previous episodes. We're going to write a nullable infrastructure wrapper. All of the HTTP code is going to be wrapped up in a HTTP server. And then we're going to make that HTTP server nullable. So we're going to have the ability to, uh, we're going to have one class or module that has handles everything related to HTTP serving. And then we're going to have the ability to turn that off. And then finally, how do we test that our code responds to requests? We're actually not going to get to that in this episode because it, there's a ton of stuff to cover already. Uh, we will get to this next week. But at some point, we are going to need to have our code respond to requests. And if the code's not actually running, if the server's not actually running, how do we do that? One way to do it is with behavior simulation. Behavior simulation is a production a real production method on our infrastructure wrapper that generates events as if they were real. It, it actually runs the exact same code that a real event, a real request would run, except that it doesn't need a real request. It can just start that code manually uh, in our test. So we might have a method such as HTTP server dot simulate request that would run all the code that is run when a real request comes in. So those are the ways that we are going to build our microservices without mocks. We're going to build. Uh, we're going to start by doing programming intention, by programming by intention in our root 13 server. Then we're going to build a null uh, infrastructure wrapper called HTTP server. We're going to make it nullable, and then next week we'll come back and we'll do the behavior simulation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, your questions are welcome. I see that there's already some activity in the uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, if you, again, if you'd like to follow along, github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Uh, check out the tag 2020-06-02. At the end of the stream, the finished code will be up under the tag 2020-06-02-end. Now, if you would like to follow along, you're going to need a copy of Node.js installed. Everything else is in the repo, though. It's all vendored in. So once you have Node.js installed, you should be able to run build.sh or build on Windows, and that will lint the code and run the tests. If you run build quick, that will only lint and test things when they've changed. And you can run watch quick to automatically rerun the build when files change. It will also leave a nice little sound like that uh, when the tests uh, pass and fail. OK, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get to it. We are going to start out by programming by intention. So we've got our Rote 13 server. Oh, that reminds me. If you want to run this server, you just type run, and that will give you, I've already written a little command line handler to give you the usage. and. Uh, the if you type in the port, then obviously that's still to do. OK, so let's get to it. Programming by intention is writing the code that we wished we had. So down here in our run server async, what we're going to do, and to start with for today, we're just going to start the server and display on the screen that the server has been started. That's going to take the whole the whole time that we have available. So that's that's fairly straightforward, I think, in terms of what we want to do here. We'll just uh, we'll just do I don't know. Let's say something along the lines of assuming that our server is injected. Let's say that our HTTP server. So we'll say this or self. So we'll need a self here, and we'll need to pass in this here. 
Uh, when you're programming by intention, it's basically a pseudocode, so you don't have to be too real. But I do find it useful to, to think it through. So we'll have our HTTP server, and then we'll just start it. Uh, that will have to be async, and we'll pass in the port, like that. And then once that's done, we should be able to say command line dot write standard out server started on port port. I think that's what we're going to do. That's programming by intention. It's writing the code that you wish you had. And I think this is it. I think this is all we need for today's episode is We'll start the server and then write that we've started it. That's really all there is to it. And then next time we'll get into dealing with requests and responses. So of course, if I run this right now, it's, well, I think the test will pass because the tests aren't running this code. Uh, let's see, we're gonna need an async here. And we'll need a semicolon. Again, this is pseudocode. We don't really need to make this work, but uh, yeah, so if our tests still run because we're not testing this, but if I were to run this for real, it would fail in some way. Uh, yeah, boom. So that's the code that we're going to make work. So let's do that. Uh, Uncle Scientist asks, uh, do you want to go directly to the command line or tell the app that the server started and let it decide how to produce the app, uh, the output? Well, when I'm, when I'm doing programming by intention, I think, what's the simplest way I could do this? And in this case, I, I think this is the simplest way. I could have some sort of event that's generated by the HTTP server that I then listened for. And I, I assume that's what you're talking about, Uncle Scientist. But in this case, uh, because we're using async await, we can just program start async to not return until the server started. And that seems really nice and simple. And one thing I like about programming by intention is it really forces you to think about how can you make your API convenient for the caller. Uh, it may be a little more work for the for when we write this code, but it makes it nice and convenient for the caller. And I like the way that my code ends up reading when I do it this way. So now that we've got our pseudocode in, now I'm gonna just comment it out so we can get this thing working for real. So we're gonna need an HTTP server. So let's go in here, write the test for that. And as usual, we'll just make sure that this is working. Okay, there we go. So what we need to do is we need to be able to start and stop the server. Uh, our code, our production code isn't actually going to have a way to stop the server, but we need to be able to stop the server. Otherwise, our, we can't run the test more than once. So it's gonna, we're going to start and stop the server. Now, when you're dealing with infrastructure code, it's always a real challenge uh, because the, the third-party libraries you use are often complex. They've got lots and lots of different options to deal with. And so what I find is that when I'm just getting started, uh, wrapping up some piece of infrastructure, I actually find that the hardest part is figuring out how that infrastructure is supposed to work. And Node's HTTP library is no exception. Now today, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I did rehearse it, so we're not gonna run into a lot of problems. But in prepping for this, I ran into problem after problem after problem that I had to debug. To make this easier, I typically will write the infrastructure code directly in my test so I can see it working. And I will run it with console output, command line output, so I can see how it works before I turn it into actual production code. So let's see, uh, let's see that work. So we're gonna need our HTTP library. 
And if you're in another language or even in Node.js, we'd probably not be using the raw HTTP. We might use something like Express or Koa in Node.js and C Sharp. You might use ASP.NET. In other languages, you'll use other libraries. Uh, I'm choosing to go straight to the Node.js libraries because I don't want to bring in extra dependencies for this exercise, but in a real system, we probably would. But the way it works is exactly the same. You're still going to wrap up that third-party code, whether it's your library, standard library, or whether it's a third-party system. Either way, it's you still have to wrap it up, and you're going to do basically the same thing. So the way HTTP works is we can say create server, and that's going to give us a node server back. I'm going to call it node server to distinguish it from the H from our server that we're about to create. Now that should work just fine. Once we've done that, we can say node server dot listen and pass in a port. And I'm going to use 5001. Now, if I've done that correctly, this should start the server and listen on that port. And we can tell that that's happened because the build won't exit. So let's run the build. We'll see it run. Yeah, and the build's not exiting. So it's likely that our server is running. Of course, we don't want our code to just hang. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need it to, uh, we need it to return when it's done. We can check when it's we can check when the server started by listening for an event called listening. And I'm going to log that that listening event is actually happening. And again, this is how I deal with infrastructure I'm not familiar with. I've coded in my test. I use console logs or other sorts of output to see what's going on. And by having it in a test, this makes it easy for me to control what's happening. And then I can factor it into the real production code. Uh, once it's working. So let's go ahead and build that. We should see this say listening, and then it should hang. Good. Okay. So now we need to basically say we're done. So I'm going to make this an asynchronous function. I'm going to await a new promise. Let's see. And then when that promise is done, I'll say server started. Now that's not going to run yet because there's promises never resolving. So let's see that. Yeah. But now if I have the promise resolve here, when we get the listening event, that should now work. There we go. Now the the code's still hanging because we're not shutting the server down. So that's what's next. Let's make this server shut down in some way. I'll listen for a new promise. I'll wait for a new promise. And now we're going to say node server dot close. That should tell the server to shut down. And when we do, when it does shut down, we should get a close event. So after I've done this right, we should now see listening server started close. Let's see, it's saying node server is not defined, right? So we're going to need to return the node server. I can do that by passing it through to resolve and then getting it here. There, listening server started closed. We're good. Uh, the test is timing out though. So we, what we need to do now, so we are, the test is timing out. That's good. The process is exiting. So we are successfully closing the server, but we need to exit the test. And to do that, we just need to resolve this promise. And that should cause the test to run clean. And there we go. Excellent. Okay, now that we understand how the infrastructure works, now we need to move it into the production code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to factor it out into a method. And we'll call that start async. Uh, 
That should work just the same. I can run our watch script now that we've got the test working all the way. And I can take our stop method and can factor that out into a stop async. Good. Now that we have that, we can move these into our HTTP server. Of course, we'll need an HTTP server, um, which I'll do this way, HTTP server.create. Uh, Uncle Scientist says, uh, you factor out of the test code still? Oh, it sounds like uh, I answered his question already. Thanks for the question, Uncle Scientist. So I'm gonna uh, create the HTTP server, which is not defined, of course. And then we'll need to make it. And then we'll need to export it and make our static create method. Now, because this is going to, this is real production code and because it's complicated, I'm going to introduce something here that I haven't introduced uh, up until now. Let's make sure this test is passing. It is. Good. And that is runtime type checking. If I'm using a statically typed language like Java or C Sharp or TypeScript, then I don't need to do this. But if I'm using a dynamically typed language, because complicated programs, there are so many ways that you can mess up your code, uh, that you can call the function incorrectly, I find it always, always helpful to do type checking of some sort. In a statically typed check, language, the compiler does it for me. In a dynamically typed language like JavaScript, I use a runtime type check, runtime type checker. And I'm going to use one that is not available open source. It's just in the repo. It's something I wrote years and years ago. If you'd like to use it, you're welcome to grab it. It's called Ensure. And the way it works, you say Ensure signature, you pass in the arguments, and then the list of art, the types that are allowed, which in this case is nothing. So you're going to see me using this ensure signature throughout the uh, today's exercise. Uh, ZLS Pro asks, uh, why not use a constructor? Uh, in another language, I would, but in JavaScript, because it doesn't have private constructors, I find it useful to have a convention of only using factory methods. Um, it's not strictly necessary. I just find it makes things cleaner. So our create is going to need to return our new HTTP server. And now that we have this HTTP server, we should be able to call server.startAsync. So we can take this and we can move it into here. And that needs to have the port passed in. And then here we should be able to say server.startAsync port. It wants HTTP. There we go. Excellent. Now we can do the same thing with stop async. Very good. And now we can clean this up. Um, I think I'm going to have, because uh, start async is going to end up, I think, with additional methods, uh, additional things passed into it, I'm going to make this a object uh, with, with named parameters. I just find that that's more convenient uh, when I'm doing complicated code. And I am, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit because I know what I want to put in the start async. I'm going to say ensure signature arguments, and that's going to take a structure which has a port option, which is a number. This is going to cause our test to fail because we're not actually doing that, saying it should be an object containing port number, but it was just a number. So here, we'll say port port. There we go. And then down here in stop, 
we don't need to pass in the node server. We can just store the node server as an instance variable. So let's do that. We'll store it. And then we can use it. Okay, and same here. And here. Then we don't need that. I mean, that we can inline. There we go. Oops, missed one. And we don't need this here. In fact, we can say that we don't expect any arguments. This is going to cause our test to fail because we do have that in. We're called, being called with too many arguments. But here, we'll do that. Oh, we got an error, address in use. So what happens is if we throw an exception, uh, if we throw an exception here and stop async, then the server never stops. And then our tests, uh, because the server continues running, all of our tests are going to fail from that point forward. So I just need to restart the tests. Okay, and we don't need to return the node server anymore, or say server started, or here. Okay. Uh, Pellet asks, uh, do you need to blow up if someone tries to start it twice, or just punt and keep the old one? I think I'm going to have it blow up, and actually that's a really good point. Uh, let's go ahead and do that next. Uh, let me see if this is as good as I want it to be. Don't think we need the console logs anymore. In fact, here we can just say, well, no, let's keep that out like that. Here we could probably just say resolve. And here we could probably just say resolve. Okay, and Uncle Scientist reminds me a uh, return statement can be used, or I can return new promise like that. And here I can return a promise. There we go. Okay, and how's our test look? That looks pretty good. Okay, so let's get to what Pellet suggested, which is that what happens if it somebody starts it twice? We could just return the existing one again, but I prefer to have my code fail fast because I can't think of a situation where somebody would want to try to start it twice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that it fails fast if server is started twice. So we'll need a server, we'll need to start it, and then we're going to need to stop it when we're all done. So I'm going to do a try finally so that it stops even if we get an exception, like if the assertion fails. And this should all work if I remember my semicolons. And now we can assert that if we call server.start again, that we get an error of some sort. This throws async, by the way, is not built into Chai. This is something I added. It is in the repo. I've got a little uh, assert library that wraps Chai and adds additional assertions that Chai doesn't give me. Okay, so we'll get some sort of error message. Uh, can't start server because it's already running. I want my error messages to be really, really explicit because in production, when things fail, you just don't have time or the inclination to go figure it out. So it's, it's 
good to have your error messages be super explicit, very readable. So we don't want to just say can't start server. We want to say why we can't start the server so that whoever's debugging this can figure out what matters to them, which is why did we try to start the server when it was already running? Now this is not going to pass. It's going to fail with address is already in use. So now we can come into here um, and we can just say if this server is not equal to, oh, let's say null, then we'll throw new error, can't start server because it's already running. And we will need to have, we need to initialize the server to null. Okay, I have to restart because I don't think we shut the test down properly last time. There we go. That's good. Uh, Odino says, uh, for the test starts and stops server, it doesn't seem to have any assertions. That's true, it doesn't. Um, and I don't know that it it needs them right now. Uh, it's just It's just documenting how it works. I would make assertions on it if I could, but the only way to check that the server is actually running is to either poke into the internal variables and look at the node server and see if it's running or expose um, or make a request against it which isn't supported yet. So we will get to that later, but for now I'm happy with this. It's good enough. Um, basically, we know it's starting because stop works and we know stop works because the tests aren't hanging, which is, uh, it's a little bit sketchy, but I'm, I'm still pretty confident that this code works with the way it's written. Okay, so we fail fast if the server started twice. Now we have this, this private variable of this dot server, and we could do something fancy like returning a closure so that we could start the server over and over again. But again, for this for the way this code is written, I don't think that that's necessary. We, the micro, we're only going to have one microservice server, and if we want more, for some reason, we can just instantiate new instances of HTTP server. Uh, let's see. We need to say that it fails fast if the server is stopped before it started, or, but um, before we do that, this duplication is bugging me. I'm going to pull out a start async function that basically does this so that we don't have to be constantly passing this in. And as we change start async in the future, it will be nice to have a single place to put those changes. So I should be able to say start async server and here and here and for symmetry let's do a stop async as well okay now let's fail fast if the server is started before it's uh, stop or stop before it started. And actually, before we do that, it just occurred to me that with the way this code is working right now. I think if we try to start the server again, it's going to fail. So let's check that out. Yeah, it thinks the server's already running and it's not, so we obviously have to fix that. So down here in close, 
we'll reset the server to null. That should do the trick. Good. And now we can say that the server fails fast if it's uh, when it isn't running. So we should see this should fail. We want to say can't stop server because it isn't running. And this is a good example of why it's nice to have our code fail fast. Calling stop would cause the code to fail, but it gives us this error message, cannot read property on of null. And if I were to get that in production logs, that would be useless. But if I got can't stop server because it isn't running, that I can work with. So let's go ahead and implement this. There we go. Okay, so we've got our stop and start working. Uh, there's one more piece here though, which is what happens if the address is not available for some reason? Uh, I think we want the code to fail gracefully if server uh, doesn't or errors out has startup error. So we'll make a server, we'll start it, and then, and we'll need to close that server when we're done. And then what I would want to try to do is I want to try to start another server. And this should throw an exception. And it is already, but I wanted to throw something like um, couldn't start server due to error. And then some sort of error message. So we got uh, addresses already in use. Yeah, so let's see if we can fix that. Here, in our server code, we can say on air. And then we can say uh, reject new error, couldn't start server. due to error. And I'll just pass the error through. And I think that will work. Uh, Pellet says, uh, wouldn't that event be thrown even if error occurs after server start? Uh, I don't believe so, Pellet. I think that the way it's defined for node is this only happens when server starts. Uh, other errors, there is another way of getting errors, but it's got a different event. It's called client error. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, we're getting couldn't start server due to error, listen, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that is what we want. However, this message, uh, from experience, I know that this can vary according to which operating system you're running in. So I don't want to hard code this specific string. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a regular expression to say that it starts with couldn't start server due to error. Then any number of things could happen. And then the error code, e, e address in use, did I get that right? Uh, is going to, that's provided by node. So that will be cross platform, but the rest of it, 
uh, could vary. So I'm going to leave that alone. I think this will be cross-platform. I haven't actually tried this. So if it doesn't work for you, then modify the regex a little bit so it is cross-platform. Okay, uh, it says unterminated regular expression. Well, that looks right to me. What am I getting wrong? There we go. Okay, so now it's failing gracefully when we have a startup error. That's good. I think this pretty much covers it. Let's take a look at our tests. Well, one thing that's bugging me about these tests is the way that we're repeating this try finally. That's a lot of noise that makes the test harder to read. So I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce a new helper function called mm, uh, start and stop async. And let's just have that create the server, start the server, run sort of, sort of function, and then stop the server. And that way, all of that sort of mess will be hidden away from me. This should work because I'm not using it yet. And then here I should be able to take all of this and replace it with start and stop async. And hopefully that will work. Uh, oh, right here. It, this needs to be async. There we go. Excellent. And let's do the same thing here. Server is not defined. Oh, we need to pass the server through. There we go. Yeah, I mean, infrastructure tests are always complicated and hard to read, but I think this is pretty clean. So uh, Uncle Scientist says, uh, wait, how did that work? I'm, well, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Uncle Scientist. If you're talking about start and stop async, um, line 33, Uh, the test on line 33 doesn't create a second server, but start and stop async creates the server. Um, and then we try to start it again. So if we take out the code to that checks to see if the server's already running, we should see that fail. Yeah. Um, we get the startup error instead of the can't start server because it's already running. So I think that proves that the test is actually working. Hopefully that, is, that answers your question, Uncle Scientist. Okay, I think we've got our basic server implemented. I'm gonna go ahead and check this in. Uh, Uncle Scientist goes on to say, is line 22 needed? Uh, no, it is not. Thank you. Oh, I thought it wasn't. Uh, that may be just a bogus error. Yeah. Okay, and if we don't need that, we can call this just server. I'm going to comment this though, saying and say uh, fails because another server is already running. And then here, maybe I'll clarify this. No, I think this one is pretty clear already. And I'll just amend the previous commit. So now we have a server that can start and stop. And in theory, we've got everything needed to write this code. 
uh, but we don't have the ability to test it yet. So that's what's next. We're going to need to do a couple of things. First, we need to have our way, a test have a way of knowing if the server started. And I think to implement that, I'm just going to add a, a variable or an accessor that tells us if the server has started. So we'll need a server. That's just to get the lint to work. Okay, so we'll need a server and then we'll assert that the server is not started. That's going to fail because we don't have is started. Then once the server is started, uh, we'll need to do a try finally to make sure we stop it. I'm using try finally here because I want to use the server that we're managing ourselves. That should work, except it's stop async, and this should be a wait. This is start async. And then here we should say that the server is started as true. And that will fail because it's hard coded. And then just to finish this out, I'll assert that it goes back after the server stopped. Uh, Jitter Ted says, uh, would it make sense to create a synchronous start and stop instead of having a wait all over the place? Uh, it's I don't believe it's possible uh, Jitter Ted in Node.js to make it synchronous. Um, the way Node.js works is starting a server is just inherently asynchronous. Uh, if you have another idea, I'd love to hear it, but I'm, I don't think there's a way to do that. I guess what you're, maybe you're asking about start and stop here. Um, yeah, that has to be asynchronous because it's calling things that are asynchronous and in Anytime you call something that's asynchronous in JavaScript, it pollutes all the callers, and they have to be asynchronous as call. Uh, Jitter Ted goes on to say, I meant extracting a await start async to put the await inside it. Um, yeah, again, once you have a function that has a await inside of it, you have to have a await in anything that calls that function. There's no way to, to abstract it out entirely, at least in JavaScript. Okay, so now that we have our is started, I'm going to go ahead and check that in. So now we have the ability for our test to tell if the server started, but we have one more piece to do here, which is that we don't want our test to actually start the server. So now we need to make our infrastructure wrapper nullable so that it can be created in a state that doesn't actually start and stop a server. Uh, Odino says, uh, would you combine the two tests on line 12 and 21? You mentioned that the first test is intended for documentation. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this test is not really useful at this point. I think all of our other tests are doing everything that it does. However, I think in terms of documentation purposes, this one is e easier to read. So I think I would keep this just because I, I like to have the first test in any test suite be sort of what is the most basic, simple, obvious case to use so that somebody who's looking to understand how the code works can read, can read it and sort of get that sense. And then I'll go down from there and make it more and more complicated and more and more nitpicky and detailed. So I kind of like this just for the way it has documentation. I don't love that it has no asserts in it, but again, I don't think there's any 
good way to assert on it right now. Okay, Uncle Scientist says, uh, 10 minutes to make this nullable. <laughs> Ready, steady, go. Let's do it. Uh, so we need to make this nullable. Uh, I'll describe nullability. And we're just going to say that it doesn't actually start or stop the server. So I'll make a server that is a null server. And of course, that's going to fail because we don't have that function yet. Create null. Check the signature. And we'll start out by just returning a new HTTP server. So that should work. And then I'm going to start the server. And I'm going to assert that if we try to start the server again, actually, that this should uh, not throw. Because if it's null, right now, if we start the server twice, well, actually, if we start a different server, it's going to fail because that address is already in use. But if the server isn't actually started, then it shouldn't fail. So this should fail because we haven't implemented nullable yet. Yeah, that's exactly right. We got the could not start server due to error. I have to kill that because it didn't stop the server. Now we're going to come in and we're going to make this nullable. But before I do that, I need to have a way of injecting our, our embedded stub. So let me go ahead and comment this out. Get our test running again. And we will inject HTTP into our constructor so that we can control it. And if we've done that, then down here, we can use it. OK, I think we're good there. So now for our null code, We want to inject an embedded stub. We're going to inject a null version of our of our HTTP. So I'll just come down here. I'll make a null HTTP, and that's going to have a create server on it, which doesn't do anything for now. And we'll pass that through here. Now this code isn't going to work yet because we're going to we're going to it's going to return nothing and then we're going to call on on that so we should see a failure that says on is not a function or something like that yeah i can't read property on of undefined so now we'll make a new class for a null node server and now it's going to say that the on method doesn't exist well first we have to return new null node server here. On is not a function. Now on is part of event handling and in node.js that's all handled through an event emitter like this. Now it's complaining that listen is not a function. And that's because we're calling listen right here. So we'll implement that. And now I expect that this code's going to hang. And the reason it's hanging is because 
after we call listen, we wait to get the listening event and we only resolve our promise when the listening event is called. So what we need to do is we need to have our stub code simulate that. I'm going to have it do it uh, asynchronously. This isn't strictly necessary, but it's more real, so I like to do it that way. Let me do this that event emit listening. And that should work. And it does. Now this may seem like a lot of work, but and you do need to understand how the third-party code you're using is being used, but you don't need to re-implement the actual code. You don't need to understand how it works under the covers. All you need to understand is how your code uses it. And you only need to implement the bare minimum necessary to make your code work. So this is really all we need to get start async to work. Of course, we also need stop async to work, which is going to uh, call close and listen for the close event. So let's go ahead and get that working. Uh, close is not a function as expected. And now this is going to hang, I think. Yep, because we're not getting the we're not getting the close event that causes this promise to resolve. But that should do it. And there we go. I think we now have a nullable HTTP server. We can start it and we can stop it without it having a real server running. So I'm going to go ahead and check that in. <laughs> yes, in seven minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Scientist. I want to point out here how simple this null this embedded stub is. This even for a real, you know, a complicated thing like nodes HTTP, this is the level of complexity I see in my embedded stubs. They usually are really simple because the complexity of the embedded stub is proportional to the code that uses it, not the code that you're stubbing out. Okay, we are almost done here. We've got our uh, We've got our nullable infrastructure. Now we just need to use it inside of our Rote Chain server. So let's go ahead and come over here and we'll say that it starts the server. We're going to need to uh, need some way of starting the server. Now you can see here we already have something that creates the command line, nullable command line, and creates the server and runs start. So let's just pass in the HTTP server. Create a new version of that server, pass it into create, and let's return the HTTP server when we're done. Then up here we can say start server async. We'll pass in the command line arguments of 5000. And then we'll assert that the HTTP server is started. And I expect this will fail. Well, <laughs> for more reasons than one, I'll need to have async. I expect this will fail because we're not actually starting the server. See, we're going to need HTTP server. Yeah, it says it should start the server, but it's not. Now, in a production code, we'll need to get the server in. I'll get that here. Provide a default for when we're not injecting it. We'll need that, pass it through here, and store it off. 
this should still fail. We're still not starting the server. But now, down in Run Server Async, we should be able to say, Start the server. And that failed. And this is exactly why we want to have sociable tests, because originally when we wrote this, we thought, oh, we'll make it just pass in the port. But later on, we decided we wanted to take an object. And if we were using mocks, this would not fail because our mocks would be defined to work exactly the way it does. But that's not how it actually works. So we need to pass port through here. And we're passing a string through. What we're getting from the command line argument is a string, and it needs to be a number. That's another example of how a sociable test makes sure that you're not only calling your dependency, but you're calling it correctly in a way that actually works. So let's do take care of that. We'll say parse int 10. There we go. Now it's actually working. Let's uh, add in the last little bit. We're going to assert Hey, the most newbie, thanks for joining us. We are just about done here. I'm going to say that the command line get last standard out is equal to server started on port 5000 with a carriage return. And it's not saying that. So now we can come down here and confirm it. Okay, test pass, code should work, right? Let's try it out. We run 5000, then we get server started on port 5000, and it is actually serving. And that is uh, where we're going to stop today. Uh, this has been a long episode, but I'm going to stick around for more questions um, in just a moment. Uh, next, but before that, a few announcements. Uh, if you do have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, and I'll get to them in just a few moments. Uh, our announcements, uh, next week, we're going to continue this exercise of creating a microservice without mocks. We're going to build the requests. What we have left to do is building the request and response code, and then building uh, the application code to do all the stuff that it needs to do, 404s, actually doing the microservice uh, logic, and so forth. Next week, we're only going to probably get part of that done, most likely the requests and maybe the responses as well. So that's going to be next Tuesday, noon Pacific, same time as this one. Uh, that's going to be Tuesday, June 9th. And then also, if you enjoyed what you saw today, uh, please do give me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. Be happy to talk to you about how I could do similar training for your company uh, using your actual code base, your language, your frameworks, uh, your pace. So uh, if you'd like if you'd like to do that, please uh, give me a call. I'd love to, uh, or send me an email. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, you can also tweet me at uh, James Shore on Twitter. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions, so I th and we've uh, gone a little bit long, so I think this is a good spot to stop. Thanks very much for coming along with us. That is creating a microservice server without mocks. Um, Looks like we do have one question here. Let me get this real quick. Uh, Pellet says, uh, once you have the nullable infrastructure in place, uh, would you remove the earlier test that, that hit the direct infrastructure? In this case, would you change your tests for server starting with null server? Um, no, actually, I wouldn't, Pellet. And the reason is, is that in my, in my uh, infrastructure test, I want to check that the infrastructure really works. So if this was all using null, then that wouldn't check this code here. And I, I want to check that this code actually works. Um, it would check that it sort of works, but I need to know that it works for real. Uh, thanks for the question, Pellet. And thank you all for, for watching today. That is it for today. Again, next time, uh, June 9th, Tuesday at noon Pacific, we're going to look at actually handling uh, requests that come in from a real client. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you all next time.